Hello everyone, got another video. Uh, nothing in my videos, in any of them, is intended for illegal purposes. I'm not here teaching anybody to do anything illegal. And it's all uh, history. Most of it's all history. You know, I haven't had dogs for decades. But I love the history of the breed, and I have my own experiences with it. And I include the experience of others. Most of them old timers, retired. A lot of them a lot older than me. So that's one of the reasons why I get, uh, try and get them on my, uh, on my YouTube channel so that they can share the past with you. It's information, it's education, it's fiction, it's, it's, uh, interesting, I think. But this uh, video came from, uh, you know, I asked some questions on my video end of the year projects. And this is something I'm trying out to get the people involved, even though we're not involved live. Uh, we can get them involved by them asking questions. They did that, got some pretty good questions. So, you know, if it's successful, you know, uh, people press the like button or view it a lot, you know, I'll keep doing it. Uh, if it's not that successful, I'm going to keep doing it anyways. <laughs> if nothing else, for my own pleasure and the few that enjoy it. But, you know, I always get good responses, man. We get good, I get good uh, feedback, good back and forth, you know, comments, opinions, other people's experiences, even in the comments section. So I appreciate that. Uh, I'll start out with, I went from the, the one that's, came in first and went up like that so just giving just due to the ones who commented first and then on down the line like that so if you go back and match them up it's going to be from the bottom to the top rather from the top to the bottom of that of that video and I just took the questions one by one and I'm going to attempt to answer them <laughs> uh, this one was from uh, the servant David show uh, mastitis in pregnant females you know what is it it's an infection and inflammation uh, they develop fever and pain from it uh, along with that inflammation and redness in one area of the breast they have flu-like symptoms uh, fatigue and uh, you know Usually they prescribe oral antibiotics and pain medication. Uh, you may have to hand milk your pups during this period of time. Because it can, uh, you know, make the milk bad, you know. Plus it's sensitive, you know. Pups have no uh, compunction for being easy with their moms. They'll attack them teeth like crazy sometimes. Uh, the female may act adversely towards them it's just that she's in pain you know uh they usually give anti-inflammatory non-steroidal drug uh so i got i, I kind of look some of this stuff up you know antibiotics like uh amoxicillin cephalexin clavulaminate you know and uh the thing with with you know i'm not a vet i never had that problem and it doesn't mean that i wouldn't have had that problem in the future if i'd kept dogs but i'm talking a couple of decades of having and breeding dogs and i didn't have a lot of those issues with my dogs and one of the reasons why is i practice preventative maintenance so the reason uh one of the main reasons females get um, mastitis is because their area isn't clean. You know, that teat is open, exposed a little bit at the tip. So if the area is not clean, they can pick up an infection that way, which leads to mastitis, and now you have a problem. So uh, that's why I was big. On preventative maintenance because I'm not a veterinarian so you try and, and evaluate the situation of where you're keeping your 
females before, during, and after pregnancy, and how you're keeping them, what's the upkeep, what's the maintenance, you know. And I understand today people are into natural stuff and they don't like additives, they don't like poisons and toxins and all that. That all makes sense. But some of this stuff is necessary, like using Clorox, like using uh, sprays and, and uh, you know, uh, pesticides and stuff, right? There's ways to apply them. There's ways to use them so that there isn't any negative effects from them. I mean, if you're going to spray your dog's area with Clorox or Malathion, you know, or some other toxic chemical, you don't do it while the dog's there. You, you have to remove them. It's a process, and it's a long process, and it takes time. And if you keep them inside your home, there's a lot of cleanup. There's a lot of maintenance. Whether you have them in a basement or a room or like we did, Angie had them in the, in the, uh, uh, what do you call it? The pantry, right? So there's, there's a lot of, uh, germs and dirt and crap and piss involved, right? And, uh, that one of the one of the reasons for this, and I think the main reason for them contracting all kinds of stuff, or a lot of times cur dogs, normal dogs that are run loose or just run all over the street, or you have them in your yard running loose, is because they're confined. So all the toxin smells, all the crap and the piss, it's in one area. All the dirt, all the bugs, all the um, you know. Uh, coccidiosis and parvo and and uh, coronavirus and all that stuff it's confined to that area right that's the reason I was so uh, adamant about keeping them clean for instance we sprayed every dog's area even though it was on dirt sprayed their whole area inside the house outside the house un underneath their house all over their dirt with Clorox once a week right that, that was just standard I use seven dust on them now I put it directly on them I put it directly in their house right so when you see people having issues you know my dog got ticks and my dog got fleas and my dog it's the maintenance part I didn't really have that. Sometimes you have an outburst of flies or something like that, and they're hard. You got to combat it, or you do have fleas and ticks, you know, because of where you live, right? And it's hard if you live on acreage to, you know, kill all that stuff. But at least in their area, you can do it on a regular basis, and if nothing else, it keeps it down. If not, even though it might not totally wipe out all the ticks and fleas, right? Or spiders. Spiders will grow under their house. Black widows, you know. You, you may have uh, coccidiosis from birds. I eliminated all of that. I didn't have birds in my trees. I didn't have uh, varmints running around. If they got to my dog, that's, they had to come from a field next door or across the street or something like that. I didn't have my chickens near my dogs, you know. And we did that old thing where you have a tray of of uh, bleach, you know, where every time you go out in the yard, you step in it. Someone comes to visit, they got to step in it. I don't know how effective that was. But made me feel better. Even had a litter. My partner did. He lost. I had one pup out of the litter. That was Johnny Handsome. I gave him to Vince. He made champion. The whole litter died, and Johnny Handsome got parvo, but he didn't die from it. We were able to save him. He was the only one that lived from his litter. Just because of that preventative stuff I'm talking about, you know. So that's one of the reasons why I, I was so heavy on the preventative maintenance stuff. Uh, because, you know, meds like that were not readily available. You know. Uh, 
and and uh, I'm not versed in all the medical issues that come up. You can you can you can look them up. You can learn, but acquiring the right stuff is the problem, and and it can be a problem. Still is a problem. That's why you get so many questions sometimes. You know, what do I give them for this? What? Well, there's this and that. How do you get it? It's not easy. People talk like it is because they may have an outlet for it. They may be able to acquire a lot of this stuff. And, but most people ain't. And then learning the use of it. So my first and foremost thing was preventative. How do I prevent coccidiosis? Keep all the birds away. How do I prevent parvo and all these other diseases? You know, spray. Use seven dust. Use malathion. But, again, you have to remove the dogs from the area. So, when I bleached, we moved the dog, put them in a crate, put them inside the house, spray the area. Wait for it to dry up. Because if you have bleach all over the place and you have it inside their house and all that, you know, and it's, it's fresh, it can cause blindness. It'll burn their eyes out. So, you have to at least do that. And, you know, if you're doing it for flies, yeah, it works while the Clorox is there. But once it dries up, the flies come back. That, that's not what it's for. It's to kill any bacteria, kill any poisons, you know. Like spraying Lysol everywhere, you know. Kill 99% of bacteria. I don't know if that's true. But at least if it's on that surface, if it's in the ground at that moment when the Clorox hits it, uh, you killed it. And you have to, you know, cut your lawn. <clears throat> High grass brings bugs. Keep your lawn down. Don't leave standing water. And especially with females that are producing milk, their tits, teats are vulnerable. You got to keep them clean. If you really love your dogs, it may mean bringing that bitch inside shortly before she has her pups, during whelp, and till they're weaned. So you're looking at a couple of months at least of her being inside. If you can't do that, wherever you have them outside, I don't care if you have the maximum setup, high dollar shit, or just a kennel run, or, you know, some uh, old tin barn or something, you know. Keep it clean. And anytime they're enclosed because stuff can be transferred in the air, you got to be cognizant of that too. If you have nasty shit lying around, some bug or fly or something's going to transfer it. Some flea's going to transfer it. Dead animals, decaying, this and that, could be a quarter mile away. So, you know, it's it just a matter of keeping them females clean. If you value them pups, I can't see going through all that trouble. And it's happened. I've lost dogs to Parvo and had coronavirus hit and all like that. But just regular shit that's preventable, you know. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't have to happen. So if you're going to put all this time and money into them, make sure their setup is secure and proper. You know, their whelping box is right, you know, where the female don't squash them and lay on them and all that. The temperature cool in the summer, warm in the winter, you know, whatever it takes. But it also takes that maintenance, having the the having to recognize that, you know, potential disaster, you know, how your setups are, how you're, if you have a dog that's a very active in a kennel, make sure you don't, can't hang himself or crawl out or dig out or, you know, any kind of thing that can happen, you know, and a lot of it, it's a hard lesson you learn on the fly and you learn by trial and error, but mastitis is preventable and once you have it, it's treatable. So just take care of your females. That's why I hold them in such high regard. They're very valuable. Those are the ones that are having the pups and whelping the pups. So that's a little bit on mastitis. Uh, next one comes from uh, Derek Leonidas. Why don't dogmen keep their own pets? Uh, and this was in reference, you know, about having a registry or registering your dogs, you know. His question was along the lines of, you know, 
Isn't it the same if you just have handwritten pads and keep your own record and all that, you know? Uh, it, it, are you at a disadvantage if you don't register your dogs? You know, uh, things like that. Well, believe it or not, that's what people did. Even I did. I didn't register my, register my dogs in the past. You keep your own records. You keep your own family history. There's no disadvantage if, uh, you know, as far as that goes, you have the family history. You have the records of how you put your dogs together, you know. Uh, but the reason for a registry is not just personal. Because you may need it, or your ancestors may need it later, or somebody interested in your blood, or the dogs, or whatever. It's keeping a history of the breed. Keeping a history of your pa your, your family of dogs. Keeping a history of bloodlines. We're always looking up stuff. Even even people that say, I don't care about the history. They, they want to know how Bo Leo was bred. You know? And in that respect, if there were no personal records of his pedigree... We'd have to refer to a registry, like ADBA, right? So I have a registry available to people if they want it, right? It's private, nothing shared. I don't share it with the public. But I'm keeping a record of their dogs for them and their ancestors and for anyone else that gets dogs from them. It's on record, right? It's like the, the you know... Uh, Kentucky Derby records from a hundred years ago. They're, they're not that important. They don't mean anything as far as what's happening today or how they're breeding their horses or anything like that. But there's that history and record of those dogs, those horses that competed that won in the Derby and raced in the Derby and what their times were and all that stuff. So history is very important. It is to me and to a lot of different people. Some people, they don't give a shit about it. That's okay. That's on them. But at some point, you're going to want to know something. And if you don't keep records, even your own handwritten records, you're going to forget how your dogs are bred, believe me. You ain't going to remember from 30 years ago. You're going to get stuff wrong. I do it all the time. I ain't the only one. It happens to everybody. You can't remember everything. We don't have the capacity in our brain to do that. Most of us don't. So that's, that's the reason why registries were Develop for purebred dogs to keep a record of their lineage. Can you do it yourself? Yeah, a lot of people do. And somebody who's people who have been been breeding dogs for decades and decades have their own handwritten pedigrees. They want to keep track of their family of dogs of how their dogs are bred over time. So there's nothing wrong with it. You're not you're not losing anything. If you're if you're into selling dogs or something like that, somebody might give you some crap about it because you know uh, they may not believe you. But that that's your own integrity. Are you honest or not? What kind of reputation do you have? And they're either going to believe you or not. You shouldn't care whether someone believes you or not if you're telling the truth. That shouldn't reflect on on you know whether whether your pedigrees are right or not. You know, and just because they register them doesn't mean that's proof. Now they have DNA and all that stuff, but anything can be manipulated or changed or like that. Don't put too much into it. You know, it's important. It's a new way of doing things. Uh, people are taking advantage of it. It's just another way of proving how your dogs are bred. But if your word ain't worth a shit, then then th that's because of your reputation. If you're a liar, you're a liar whether you have DNA on your dogs or not. So, you know, that's something you got to look at and who you deal with, you know, and who, what kind of people on both ends. What kind of people are you letting your dogs go to? What kind of people want your dogs? That's all up to you. That has to be hashed out between you guys personally. So, no, there's nothing wrong with keeping your own records, having your own handwritten pads. Been done. I have old ones dating back many, many, many years ago. Not just of mine, but other people's too. Correspondence between dog men. I like it. So, yeah, you can do that. The other part of his question was... Uh, oh, Dr. Lutz. Did Dr. Lutz produce a bloodline? 
Now, uh, I know very little about Dr. Lutz. I know some of the pedigree. One of the, the main dogs I remember from back in the day was a bitch named Lutz's G Wiz. I think she lost a real famous match against, I forgot who. But I remember it coming out in the in the Sporting Dog Journal. <clears throat> and I remember uh, uh, a dog named Lutz's Little Homer, who was by Mountain Man's Grand Cha uh, Mountain Man's Champion Homer and Lutz's G Wiz. Right. And then later on he used some of the Black Rock blood and and uh uh you know g whiz was some boomerang and carver blood you know so i remember a little bit about her and dr lutz but i don't know if it was enough to say there's a lutz bloodline you know i know that blood that you know boomerang other carver stuff with mountain man's homer and all that you know was very popular in my day, there was a lot of Homer dogs being competed with. Tons of Boomerang. Carver, one of the most popular, if not the popular at the time. So I don't know if Lutz had his own bloodline, but I do remember he did have some dogs, or some dogs came from his stuff. Well-produced dogs, you know. And uh, the other question was, you know, from him was, did Peterbilt produce? Not, not too much, you know. And it could be that he produced more than what was known. They kept the breedings to themselves, you know. Uh, Peterbilt, Reddick's champion Peterbilt is the dog I'm talking about. He was a, kind of a Tudor Eli bred dog, you know. Famous dog back in the day, a very good champion, great dog, right. Uh, one of the dogs I remember was be uh, off of him would be St. Benedict's Dylan was a two-time winner. I think he took, if I remember correctly, he took heavy damage to his muzzle and survived. Uh, um, and uh, what was there? Uh, Melody. So Dylan and Melody were litter mates. And they were out of uh, Min, Min's... Uh, uh, let's see... Oh, Melody and Cherub, or, or Cherub, I think that's what they were. They were, they were Peterbilt, bred to Cherub, pro produced uh, Melody and Dylan. Th those are the only ones really that I remember hearing about, you know. I had to do a little bit of back search on it and remember. But I don't know if Peterbilt produced uh, more than just a few dogs or not. There's not a lot of records on what he produced, but as far as being a top dog of his time, he was known for that. And I do remember St. Benedict's using some of his blood uh, in their pedigrees. So uh, the next one would be from Ben Harding. Uh, he wanted to know about Stonewall dogs. I have a video of Stonewall, I think. It's posted up, so just scroll down, Ben, and see what you... Uh, see if it's still there. I'm sure it's still put up. I kind of go through Stonewall, his dog, Frank Roca, good friend of mine. He acquired Stonewall from Garner as a two-time winner. Uh, we've had stories together back and forth talking about him. He rolled him out, said he was a top dog, good performer, this and that. He almost had him hooked up for a third, but it didn't happen. Uh, and, you know, eventually got to be too old and couldn't be matched anymore, but he definitely would have took him out for his third if that show would have been uh, made you know uh champion lily white is a daughter of stonewall so you know i i have there's more information there i run through the pedigree basically a honey bunch bred dog he's got the we shared you know honey bunch blood uh frank rocca and i did you know his had more of the oldest honey bunch mine had more of the uh, of the uh, Rascal Honey Bunch. And we both had the Bow Honey Bunch stuff. But uh, those are the only two little differences. His had some Otis. Mine had Rascal. 
So uh, check it out. See what you think. Should still be up. Uh, the next one was uh, OM Gets. Game dog as a pet. It's a very good question. Are game dogs or were game dogs good pets? Of course, there's tons of them. Aside from their the competition side or their game test or whatever you want to talk about it, or style, ability, you know, uh, all that stuff. Pit bulls are dogs first. So that's how that's the first way you judge them, what type of a dog they are. And a lot of them, and I'm talking about famous dogs, were hand raised, were brought inside the house, were ha house dogs, you know. I remember Boston Blackie, he had Champion Black Jack, I think his name was, and he had Grand Champion Daisy May. They lived together in his house, you know. We brought Big Red was good inside the house, you know. Uh, brought him in, a lot of the females, you know. And when they're in that role, they're like pets. They're good with kids. Uh, there's been a lot of champions. Even some pit champions and pit grand champions become show dog champions and grand champions. They shared the two things. And a lot of them, like Tornado, double grand champion Tornado, she could be walked off the lead, you know. Uh, there was... They didn't never have any fear of her bolting and taking off after something. You know, there's videos of her walking at a motel room, I think it is, in a parking lot or whatever down the, you know, next to the room. She's just walking loose just like that, you know. Uh, Teaser's Peaches was like that. She was fine inside the motel room, you know. She was fine inside the house. A lot of dogs are like that. I've even had dogs from, from my own, uh, some friends of mine, you know bred different ways even some stuff with my blood that we raised or my grandkids raised you know they were always inside the house and just run loose in the house you know and you teach them basic manners and you teach them some obedience you know teach them some tricks or teach them you know go to your dog go to the crate and they go lie down you don't even have to close the door you tell them to stay there you know jump up on the bed lay at the end of the bed you know uh don't be a pig and get in the garbage and sling the garbage all over. You can't do that with every dog, you know, just like any other breed. Certain ones are better at certain things than others. The ones that you can bring inside and make pets, sure. And they were still good for what they did traditionally. In that way, those two don't mix. So they're a dog first. Do they make good pets? Yeah. Some of the best. Right around in cars, I've mentioned this before we took big red big red to disneyland you know no problem we would take them all over the place not him but a lot of my dog all my dogs got rode somewhere went to somewhere you know even in town to the drive throughs you know people can see the dog in there oh what a pretty dog oh look at the puppy you know take them around stores even you know some you could take them to they didn't have pet code back then or maybe they did but i've taken them inside store just walk them in they're good when they're young, you know. So yeah, they make great pets. Don't never let anybody tell you different. They're not man-eating baby killers or not like that. They're a dog first. And they're either a good one or they ain't. The breed don't matter. It's the dog itself. Uh, King Yoda. How was Jocko really bred? Was he off of Lonzo's Andy? I don't know. I go by the pedigree, you know. I've heard he was off of Grand Champion Art. I don't know how that was be possible but you know people look at dogs sometimes and they go you can tell it looks like that you can tell he's that dog no you can't a lot of dogs look the same and yeah it could be related that way could be really this way i'm not disputing that people lie and cheat they always have fake pets this and that but to say definitely that that someone knows you had to have been there you had to be part of that story who knows you know uh, if he was really off a of grand champion art, then the person that made that statement, if it's true, they would have to be around there. So either Dave Adams made that breeding while he still had art, or he was, the breeding was made after art was stolen. So someone knows it was made after he was stolen, they're part of that problem. 
don't mean that they helped steal art or anything like that, but they were involved with a dog that was stolen and they had to have known it. It's pretty, pretty heavy news. You didn't wait for that, have to wait for that to come out in the newspaper or the periodicals that art was stolen. They let everybody know because they were offering a reward for them. So anybody who would listen, uh, they would tell them, hey, I'm looking for my dog. He got stolen. As far as being off of, uh, uh, Jocko being off of uh, Lonzo's Andy, he'd have to ask Lonzo. And uh, since uh, uh, Jocko was bed, bred by Bob Rast, you'd have to ask uh, Rast, you know, maybe Vernon Jackson, you know. Vernon Jackson owned Hank Sire, I mean, uh, Jocko Sire Hank. So who knows, you know, there's a lot of stories and, and this, this goes around a lot, you know, and I mentioned it too. There's a lot of stories, almost, almost any dog you can think of, there's a story about them, of something not being true, really bred this way, who really owned them, who really conditioned them, who really handled them, who really made the breeding, you know, who this, who that goes back to the beginning of the breed. And to have firsthand account, that would be the best way of knowing hearing it second hand is still a little bit closer you know but once it starts getting out there you hear all kinds of different stories just like the one on boomerang he's really bred this way he's that way he's this and that name it stompanato just about name it bully son eli jr they're really this and that who knows so i'll i'll talk about them and when i do say certain things i always say this is what i heard or yeah i've heard that story too but as far as me stating it, like it's a fact, like I know, I don't know. Who knows? He could be off of Andy. He could really be off of Hank. Could be off of Grand Champion. Or who the hell knows? I don't know. <laughs> and like people always say, yeah, it's been so long ago. Who cares? It doesn't really matter. It don't. But you have to at least acknowledge that these topics are going to come up. I don't slide anybody for asking them. But if they want some truth from me, I can't give it to them because I don't know. I know what I've heard. And most of this stuff that comes up, yeah, I've heard it two to three different times. And with any particular dog, it's always just like this. He wanted to know if, if uh, you know, uh, Jocko was really off of Andy. Well, I, like I, that's why I brought that up. I've heard he's off of Grand Champion Art, too. I don't know. <laughs> so it's usually that way with the dog. There's more than one story behind it. Sorry if I couldn't answer your question, but that, that can't lie. I don't know. Uh, uh, the other one was feeding diamond dog food. You know, there's different types of diamond. I've used it in the past. I used the chicken. I used the lamb. Had good results with it. I forget what the ratio was, protein and fat. You know, with any of this stuff, any dog food, you know, processed dog food, the only way to tell is to test it. Try it on your dogs. Give them three months under it. You know, if you keep switching dime, dog foods, regardless of whatever kind it is, you switching them all the time, it, you can have digestive problems up to stomach, stool problems like that. Their system ain't like ours where, you know, uh, they can just eat anything they want anytime. You know, you can get your dogs used to that where uh, that's the way mine work, you know, because from a young age, they're just getting all kinds of stuff. The kids feed them this and feed them that. So they become accustomed to it. Doesn't mean they didn't have to get the runs or have upset stomach, but over time, their immunity builds up, their digestive system becomes accustomed to it. And by the time they're a year old, man, we could feed our dogs literally anything and nothing bothered them, you know. Nothing bothered them, other than something that was bad for them anyways, like cow's milk or, you know, chocolate or something like that, you know, that, that was toxic to them anyways or not good for them healthy anyways. But, you know, it didn't matter if it was cooked, raw, live, they killed it theirself, you know, chips, crap, fruit, salsa, corn, you just eat it, you know. And they, it wasn't really an adverse effect from it. You see little changes in the stool. But the thing with dog food is, you know, it's best when you feed your dogs. To feed them the same type of diet all the time, you know, 
doesn't mean you can't, you know, switch from, 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 uh, you know, beef to chicken and sometimes you add fish and all that. They can take all that, you know. It's just a lot of the other stuff, a lot of the additives, you know. And, uh, you know, there's good and bad in all of them. You just, you know, Diamond has so many different types. You, you can kind of, you know, what do you like? What do you want your dogs to eat? Do you want them to eat lamb? Do you want them to eat chicken? Do you want them to eat beef? Do you want, you know, uh, with wheat, with rice, without wheat, without rice, with, you know, all natural, organic, all, they have all that stuff. So it's just a matter of trying it, see how it works on your dog, you know. The way you tell, basically, is do they, uh, are they regular when they go to the bathroom? Do their stools look firm? Is their <clears throat> piss clear? You know, do they have problems urinating? Do, do, they, do, they, uh, do they vomit? Are their eyes stay clear? Do their nose stay wet? Do their gums stay pink? You know, it, it's a lot of, you just use your eye to see how they are adjusting to the food or how that food affects them, you know. Does it make them burp? Does it make them puke? Do they get allergies from it? Did they start developing hot spots on their skin? Are they sneezing a lot? You know? Does, you know, there's signs that just by looking at them, you can tell. So I've used Diamond. It was good. And there's all these recalls, this and that. You have to pay attention to that, you know? The recalls are on uh, generally stuff like E. coli or salmonella. You know, some kind of poisoning, some kind of stuff that gets in there because, you know, the dog companies, you know, they don't cook the food long enough to kill some of this bacteria, right? And people are under the impression that they take all this stuff, whatever it is they're putting in it, and they cook it and you cook all the nutrients out of it, right? Right? And that's not how they're processed. The one I used back in the day was called Neutromax Stress. Right? It was specifically designed for working and sporting dogs. Test this and that. We all tested it. Gave the guy feedback on it, you know. <clears throat> it was cooked to 400 degrees. And people go, wow, you cooked all the stuff out of it. No. It doesn't work that way. And a lot of the nutrients or vitamins, mineral, all that stuff... They add to dog food, it's added after the process, not during the process of cooking. So you'd have to get into it to see how do they process their food, what do they do with it, you know. And and I think one of the reasons dogs are getting poisoned and all this, they're not cooking the food long enough, you know. Or, or it becomes rancid, they just let it sit there. Or, you know, you can take eggs, for instance, you know. If you don't cook them, you eat raw eggs and you get salmonella from it, you know it's because the egg was raw and it had salmonella in it. You boil the egg for five minutes or ten, however you like your egg cooked, it kills the salmonella in there. It's not gonna, you're not gonna get it. That's the re one of the reasons why we cook food and to kill all that stuff, you know. So there are some effects from cooking food if you overcook it yeah you're going to get some of the nutrients out but just do me this look up what happens to the protein when you cook meat and see what it tells you does it say you lose 30 percent of your protein do you lose 10 percent how much it's insignificant for those of you that don't want to look it up the protein content itself you lose very little if any at all you don't have to cook the shit out of it. Just cook it till it's done. <laughs> like Justin used to say. Yeah, cook it till it's done. So some of these old myths, and there's, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with raw feed, but you got to know how you handle it. You got to know how to store it properly. So, you know, my opinion, I don't care what you feed them. As long as it's a balanced diet, it's good food, it's good for them. You can't dictate you know, to everybody, you got to feed this way and you got to do this and that and you got to feed this and this amount and that. No, that's not true. We don't all live in one little area. These dogs are all over the world as are dogs everywhere. 
You should see what they feed Iditarod dogs in, in Alaska. Ain't nothing like you feed. That's where they live. So they eat what's there. And, you know, sometimes it's cooked, sometimes it ain't. You know, they do both. You know, they give them a broth because keep them warm. Have a warm meal. And they might throw a chunk of bone or meat in there that's raw. That's how they do it. Or fish. So, you know, there's no best food or best supplement or anything when you're talking about feeding your dog. It's what's best for you, what works for you. And you want a balanced diet. And you may have to change them for different metabolisms, different dogs, different sizes, of course, different weights. So that's part of the process. It's always fun learning, checking it out. And if you're dialed in, you know what I'm talking about. You don't have to worry about it. You got it set. So it's a process. And with these dog food companies, you know, it's the same thing. Got to go through them, what you like. What works. If there's a problem, eliminate it. Uh, last one was from uh, Reese Jones. In what countries is dog combat legal? Oh, there's two more. Anyways, basically he's asking, you know, is dog fighting legal anywhere? Uh, the I don't know about other countries. Let's take Mexico, for instance, right? And, and people used to say this about the United States. You know, dog fighting used to be legal in the United States. Not really. For something to be legal, there has to be a law that says you can do it or no law that says you can't do it. So that's kind of, it was with dog fighting. It was kind of accepted. You know, it's like boxing. At one time, boxing was outlawed in the United States. So they had to make a law saying boxing was legal. There's never been a law that says dog fighting is legal. It was just accepted that people did whatever the hell they wanted to do with their dogs, their animals, right? Just like there didn't used to be laws. How do you butcher uh, animals, you know? They butchered however they butchered them, you know? Anything like that, you know? But there's always some bureaucrat want to make some law for something, right? So... Uh, in Mexico, dog fighting is not legal. This is the way I understand it, right? But it's not illegal. The problem with uh, events like that is the gambling itself is illegal, right? That part is illegal. As far as the uh, dog fighting in Mexico, I, I don't know if it's legal or illegal. The way I was explained to you is it's not illegal. It's just the gambling part is legal. Eastern Europe, you know, uh, different countries. I've never heard where it's illegal. Other countries like China, they may have a law saying it's legal. It seems to be open there. So, you know, they, uh, it's not a problem. They don't look at things like the rest of the world does sometimes. Other countries don't. Could be they have more impending problems where they're not going to worry about how you kill your chicken, you know. Uh, the euthanize it, chop his head off, you know, whatever. <laughs> they kill the chicken however they kill the chicken, and that's just acceptable. Some chop his head off, some wring their neck, and like that, whatever you do, you know. But as far as countries where it's being legal, I can't speak to that. I don't know. I just know that in some places, it's not looked at like it is here in the United States. And the here in the United States, it was basically the dog cruelty or whatever, you know, it was a misdemeanor back in the day. So even the dog fights were treated as misdemeanors back in the day. When it became a felony and then later a federal offense, that's when you start seeing heavy time given to people years in prison because it's a federal law. So that's why, you know, I would never get back into it that way. I would never risk anything like that. And I implore anybody who has pit bulls not even to think about doing that. It's not worth it. If you have any responsibilities, family, home, cars, children, all that, you got to weigh that risk. It's not like back when I got in trouble, you know, I had to, 
I had to go to jail for a year. Now you're going to prison for years. So I would not even attempt to even think about doing anything like that. And that's one of the reasons why I say this is all about history. This is what happened back in the day. I have no knowledge of anybody doing anything illegal today. And I don't want to know. It's none of my business anyways to know what people are doing. That's the way I look at it. Last one, uh, Paul Dendulk. Why is it so difficult to find good breeders in Europe? Well, going to what I just said, you know, the dogs, pit bulls were banned in Europe way before they were banned in any cities in the United States, as far as to my recollection, you know. They had heavy bands in different countries. You couldn't even own the dog in the country. In the United States, I can't remember any state doing that, but there were several cities that that happened to, major cities, where you could not have pit bulls within the city limits. Now, some of those have been repealed, and rightly so, man. You can't be prejudiced towards one breed. You have to be prejudiced towards all of them. You have to treat them all the same. That's one of the problems, you know. Uh, you can't even say that's a pit bull. How do you know? Because it looks that way. So if somebody confiscates your dog for it being a pit bull and then it comes out it's not a pit bull. What do you do then? So a lot of them people, you know, people rally behind that. And a lot of the bans, you know, uh, of pit bulls in the cities in the U.S., they were repealed, right? But finding one thing in Europe, you know, they didn't, they didn't have... The dogs and breeders and dog people in the numbers that we did here. It was only certain countries, you know. It wasn't the whole continent, I don't think, that had them. Maybe, maybe it was here and there, you know. But you're talking about the UK, you know, Ireland, England. You know, you have the Netherlands, Holland, different places, you know. They could even have been in Germany, France, all this, all over. But just not the numbers that, that were like in the United States, you know. And, you know, it's like when you have, you know, the bigger the country, the more people you have, then the more you're going to have of one particular thing. So, for example, today there's probably still a lot of pit bulls in the United States because, you know, we have 400 million people here. I don't know what the population of all of Europe is. Maybe it's that, maybe it's closer, maybe that. But any one country in Europe, I don't think, has the population except maybe for Russia or something like that. But, you know, I'm talking about Western Europe where the breed was popular. I don't think they had the numbers. So, first of all, you don't have a lot of dog people. You don't have a lot of uh, dogs uh, going by that. And then uh, having people preserve it. Because I'm sure when they banned them, they confiscated the pit bulls, euthanized them, killed the shit out of them. So you lost a lot of bloodlines. You lost a lot of dogs. And they're not available anymore. So the numbers are going to be smaller. But it's like anything else, you know. You do some research. You do some networking. You find good people that have, uh, you know, good dogs. Raise them properly. And they're healthy and kept records. Uh, you can find them, you know. And a lot of people, believe it or not, they want pit bulls just as a pet. Just like what was spoken about earlier. They just like the dog. Easy maintenance. High pain tolerance, you know, they don't get sick. But like a lot of, you know, they stub their toe, they're not going to cry. They fall down and hurt themselves, it's not going to be a big problem like some dogs, you know. They got short hair, kind of easy maintenance, they'll eat just about anything, so, you know. They're intelligent, a lot of people, even in the United States, that's all they have them for today. That's all they're for, you know. Hunting, what are some of the things you can do with dogs, you know, uh, that, that, uh, legal, you know? It's not all about dog fighting with the pit bull. It never was. So you can hunt with them. You can do shows. You can do the legal sports. They have uh, French ring training and, you know, the, the, the wall climb and the treadmill race and the hang time and the weight pull. Uh, obedience train. Even protection training, which I'm not high on protection. I don't, I don't like the pit bull doing that. But hey, people do what they want. There's that option. Or just to have them as a pet. 
So that about does it for this video. I hope I answered your questions. If not, we can get more into it. Thanks for your support and more on the way. I still have some interviews coming up. I think you're going to like the next interview I do. Very nice gentleman. I'm not going to say his name here because they always never set till it's set, but it'll come out soon. So thanks again for your support, all your likes and subscriptions, all that stuff. We'll keep it going.